Hello, and welcome to this Friday surprise video, which at this point is no longer much of a surprise, but surprise. Uh, chapter 5 assignment, problem number 3. And I chose problem number 3 because it allows me to talk a little bit about the binomial distribution. It allows me to show you a couple ways of solving these problems. It allows me to, and quite frankly, to, to point out that falling directions on this assignment or on any connect assignment is very important even if those directions are not precisely correct. So let's move forward on this one. Problem three. The USGA requires that the weight of a golf ball must not exceed 1.62 ounces. The association periodi periodically checks golf balls sold in the United States by sampling specific brands stocked by pro shops. Now suppose that a manufacturer claims that no more than 13% of its brand of golf balls exceeds 1.62 ounces in weight. In other words, it's saying, let's suppose that no more than 13% of our golf balls are failures. Now, suppose that 24 of this manufacturer's golf balls are randomly selected, and let x, the random variable, denote the number of those 24 randomly selected golf balls that exceed 1.62. So x is the random variable that is the number of the way that this problem is written up. It's the number of successes. And according to this problem, we're defining, rather perversely, a success as a golf ball that is too heavy. So notice some things from this problem. The first thing to notice as it is that we're given a lot of information. We're given lots of numbers. 1.62, I don't know what to do with 1.62, 13, 24, 24, 87, I don't know what to do with all these numbers. So let's focus on the random variable itself, x. And we're told that x is the number of those 24 golf balls that are too heavy. Now this simply from the way that the problem is set up. This is a binomial random variable. And by this I mean x is a binomial random variable. Here's how we know. Let's go to page 199 in our textbook. I'll give you a few seconds. Actually, press pause as you go find page 199. Okay, now unpress pause. Now, oh wait, you didn't unpress pause. Okay, unpress pause now. Now look at the, the little display at the bottom of 199. There are four requirements for a random variable, what I will in general call an experiment, to be a binomial random variable. Requirement one is that the experiment consists of n identical trials. So now we're looking at this problem, and there's that x, and it's the number of the 24 randomly selected golf balls that exceed 1.62 ounces. So a trial in this case is going to be one golf ball, weighing it and determining it, determining if it is too heavy or not too heavy. So we got 24 identical trials here, because we're looking at 24 golf balls testing if they're too heavy or not too heavy. Requirement number two. Each trial results in a success or a failure. Remember, we're weighing those golf balls, and we've got two possible outcomes. Outcome one is too heavy, which we're defining here as a success. Outcome two is not too heavy, which we're going to define as a failure, oddly enough, because we don't want them to be too heavy. But hey, this is statistics. Requirement three. The probability of success on any trial is p, and p remains constant. Where we are told here, according to the manufacturer, that 13% of its brand of golf balls are too heavy. p is equal to 13. And that p isn't changing from golf ball to golf ball within this manufacturer's brand. It's 13% across the board. The probability of any single golf ball being too heavy, according to the manufacturer, is 13%. So p equals 13, and it doesn't change. Finally, requirement number four is that the trials are independent. 
That is, the results of the trials have nothing to do with each other. Now here's how the sampling's done. You take a golf ball, you weigh it, you put it over or off to the side, you take another randomly selected golf ball, you weigh it, put that off to the side. You're not choosing the next golf ball based on your current golf ball. The golf ball that you are selecting to weigh is just a randomly selected golf ball. Randomly selected is a key word, or I guess a key term, in determining if the measurements are independent. And since these golf balls are randomly selected, they are independent. Now, conversely, let's, let's see how this could be not independent. It would not be independent if I selected a golf ball, weighed it, and looked for another golf ball that looked about the same size as one I have in my hand, and then weighed that. Because notice, in that sampling scheme, the next golf ball I choose is going to be very much related to the one I have already chosen. Dependence. The way that the problem is actually set up, the golf balls are randomly selected. One golf ball selection does not affect the next golf ball's selection. Independent. So we've got all four requirements are met by this experiment, or this sampling. Therefore, this is indeed a binomial random variable, x is, which means it's good that they told us that it's a binomial distribution. So here's the next thing. They're going to summarize the, tape, uh, the, the paragraph for us. The Excel outputted the binomial distribution with n equals 24, because we're looking at 24 golf balls. These are 24 trials. P equals 0 0.13, because we're told the probability of success, according to the manufacturer, is 13%. And Q, which is equal to 1 minus P, is 0.87. We don't actually use that Q equals 0.87 at all. And here's the table that we're given. Now, notice that we have to use those values, because if you scroll down, you'll see use table values, use table values, use table values. So when we actually do the calculations, we have to use these values. Well, you'll have different values because this is randomly selected. Uh, generated. But these are the values to use. Now with that said, let's see how we get those values, or something close to them, using Excel. So let's open up our Excel. We notice that there are two columns. There's a column for little x, and there's a column for the probability that the random variable, big X, is equal to that little x. Now the table gives us little x values of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then let's go ahead and see how Excel calculates these binomial random variables. It's a formula, so it starts with an equals. The function is binom.dist, binom.dist. Again, since this is a function, it has parentheses, so we'll open up a parenthesis. And now let's go ahead and look at the little suggestions that it gives us. OK, so the number, the number is just going to be x, comma, number of trials, remember the number of trials was 24, comma, probability, remember from the problem, probability was 0 0.13, comma, then cumulative. If we put true in here, then what we are calculating is the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to, in this case, 0. If we want just to calculate the probability that the random variable is equal to, in this case 0, we'll just do a probability mass function, which is false. Again, the difference between true and false in this case, true means you're calculating the probability x is less than or equal to a given value. If you use true, I mean, if you use false, it's going to be the probability that x is equal to that value. And since we're calculating the probability x is equal to, we're going to use false. Hit Enter. There's probability. Copy paste. There's all the probabilities. Let's see how that compares to what the, the book gives, or what McGraw-Hill gives. 0 0.0354, 0 0.035, well, 541268, rounding. And that's important for, for any of these online homeworks, is since it says use the table values, you're going to have to use the table values.
These all are equivalent as long as you round correctly. Which actually brings up a good question. How do we round? Rounded. The function to round in Excel is round. It's a function equals R-O-U-N-D, open parenthesis, notice it's number, we're going to round that, comma, number of digits, they rounded four, we'll round four, now these numbers should match exactly. We can actually use these numbers now since they match these exactly. Now if n equals 24, why are we only going up to 5? We should go all the way up to 24. There we go. And notice that once you get beyond n equals 12, the probability is extremely small. So this column C would be this column as if McGraw-Hill decided to extend this down to 24. Okay, let's do these problems now. Find the probability that x is equal to 0. Since x is the number of golf balls that are too heavy, probability x equals 0 is, is the same thing as the probability of finding no balls that are too heavy. Well, that's given to us up here. Probability of x is equal to 0 is 0 0.0354. B. Find the probability that at least one of the randomly selected golf balls exceeds 1.62 ounces in weight. So find the probability that at least one of those golf balls is too heavy. The probability that the random variable is at least one. Greater than or equal to one means at least one. Now there's two ways of calculating this. Way one is to go back to our Excel table Note that all of these probabilities correspond to times when x is greater than or equal to 1. And then all we have to do is add these up. If we look down here, the sum is 0 0.9648. That is one way of doing it but it's not the right way for online homework. The right way is to note that the event x greater than or equal to 1 is the complement of the event x equals 0. Now remember the definition of complementary events. Two, and this is from chapter 4. Two events are complementary if there is no overlap and if their probabilities add to 1. Well, x equals 0 and x is greater than or equal to 1 have no overlap, and their probabilities are going to add to 1. So the way that we need to do this is just to calculate 1 minus the probability x equals 0. 1 minus that will change this to a 6, which is what you need to do, because it says use table values, not necessarily the real values. C, find the probability x is less than or equal to 3. x less than or equal to 3 corresponds to these four probabilities. So the probability x is less than or equal to 3 is just the sum of those four probabilities. Since our probabilities are actually the same, summing those is 0 .6189. 0 0.0354 plus 0.1268 plus 0.2179 plus 0.2388 add up to 0.6189. D. Find the probability that at least two of the golf balls are too heavy. At least two is greater than or equal to two, so we tr have to find the probability that x is greater than or equal to two. Now in general we could greater than or equal to two Add all these up, get 8380, and that should be the right answer. But we're stuck to using the numbers that are given in the table. So again, using complementary events, 
probability that x is greater than or equal to 2. That's going to be equal to 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 1. It's going to be 1 minus the probability x equals 1 minus the probability x equals 0. So the probability that x equals 1 or 0 is 0.1622. That's what it says down here on the sum, 1622. 1 minus 0.1622 is 0.8378. So again, since we're using the table values, we have to actually use the table values. And this is one way of McGraw-Hill Connect forcing you to recognize the importance of using complementary events to calculate probabilities. OK, so and E. A, B, C, and D are just probability calculations that really are stuck with, uh, with uh, chapter 5. E is going to be the bridge into chapter 7 when we start doing inferential statistics. So when we start testing hypotheses. So now, suppose that two of the 24 randomly selected golf balls are found to exceed 1.62 ounces. In other words, we observe x equals 2. So using the results from part d, do you believe the claim that no more than 13% of, the grand, of the brand, this brand of golf balls exceeds 1.62 ounces in weight? In other words, we're testing the hypothesis that p is equal to 0.13. We observe the reality of 2 out of 24 being uh, too heavy. Since we observe the reality of 2 out of 24, what is going to be called the p-value is just the probability of what we observe being greater than uh, probability of observing something greater than or equal to what we actually did observe under the assumption that the manufacturer is correct. So this number that we just calculated of 0.8378 is called the p-value, or will be called the p-value. And it's the probability of observing this reality, two balls too heavy, or something more extreme, given that the manufacturer is correct. So do I believe the claim? I actually do believe the claim, because this is a very large probability. It's pretty close to 1. If the manufacturer is correct, then 83.78% of the time, we're going to observe this reality or something more extreme, of the reality of two too heavy golf balls. And that's really the key bridge between doing these probability calculations and statistical inference. That 0.8378 is the amount of the amount that the reality supports the manufacturer's claims. It's the amount of evidence in favor of the manufacturer telling the truth. Now notice we did not say that the manufacturer is telling the truth. And that's it's an important point. We just said the, re the data, the reality, support the manufacturer's point. It gives evidence in favor of the manufacturer. In statistics, we deal with evidence, not with proof. And that is extremely important. So there we go. Let's make sure that we submit it. Yeah, submit anyway. And if we did it right, we got 10 out of 50, 20%. Now I've just got some other problems to do. Or I'll let you do those other problems. So this was problem number three, and hopefully this was helpful for you. Not just working through the problem, but hearing about how this problem connects to what you're learning in this chapter, what you learned in the previous chapter, and what you're going to be learning in chapter seven. So have a great day. Take care of yourself.